Hello guys, today I am going to show you a pure martial arts story. The story begins with a small feeble boy, born to the greatest archer family that now lives in the High Plain Mountains. With the help of his ever-strong grandfather, Samoon comes out to be one of the strongest ever warriors to grace the earth. To follow the story of this weak little kid into the strongest man alive, watch the video till the end with us. So, let's get started. We see a young black-haired kid, Samoon, polishing his archery skills. Right alongside him stands an old yet strong man, who happens to be his grandfather. I think we all can collectively agree that 60-year-old grandpas and 16-year-old teenagers are the most OP characters to exist in the shonen genres. So, let's see what this old man has got. With his hands behind his back, he analyzes his grandson's skill and explains that archery is the act of shooting an arrow. Being someone of a prodigy Samoon as he shoots, the arrow hits exactly in the middle of the target. Taking another shot this time, the kid raises the bow above his shoulders and shoots another arrow from an uncomfortable position. While the grandpa explains that a standard shot comes from standard archery, but when there are multiple enemies or you're crunched then, there won't be enough time for you to take a calculated shot. So, in that case you have to use the rapid fire technique in which arrows are shot in quick succession. Next up is the multi-shot, a technique that allows you to shoot multiple arrows simultaneously. The grandpa further goes on to mention that one isn't worthy of calling himself an archer unless he's able to use the multi-shot. Now taking the aim himself, the grandpa sizes up his target and tells the kid that he can use up to three arrows at once for the multi-shot. Saying this, he shoots the arrows that strikes into three different trees. He further goes on to explain that he can either aim at a single point or have different targets, allowing him to kill two birds with one stone and lastly, there's the hardest technique, the key guided arrow. To give a demonstration, he sets his eyes on a small bunny hopping around. As the cute, cuddly creature turns around the tree going out of sight, the old man shoots the arrow. Unexpected by both the rabbit and us, the arrow swishes around the tree and strikes right into the rabbit's heart. Can you guys guess what these two will be having for dinner? Oh I know, rabbits do. Showing some more of his cool moves, the grandpa dashes forward and then diving to his left hits a multi-shot using the key-guided technique. The three arrows simultaneously hit some birds flying in the air, sending them to their demise. Guess they'll also be having some bird meat. Look at the falling birds, the grandpa mentions that this technique of his is called a headhunter, a combination of all the archery techniques. Later in the day, as the grandpa is catching some sleep, He's suddenly woken up by his grandson. Speaking in a muffled voice, he asks, What is it? Excited, ecstatically that he'd like him to assess his archery since he's found a way to overcome the wind. But instead of getting praised, he says, The kid is struck on his head. As the grandpa tells him that he just interrupted his meditation and he was just about to figure a way to fly. Bro, what is this grandpa smoking? Not giving up? The kid also argues back and tells him that he was drooling all over the place instead of meditating. Finally giving up on his grandson's requests, he finally goes to assess him. Just as Samoon is sizing up his target, the grandfather walks up to it and stands right beside it. Having a questioning look on his face, the kid wonders if his grandfather has finally lost it. However, the old man asks him to hit the target, worrying that he might end up hitting his grandpa. Samoon hesitates. Looking at this grandpa, he yells as he asks him to be confident since a man needs to have courage. But despite the verbal motivation, he ends up putting his bow down. As the day passes by, the kid suddenly runs up to his grandfather bringing a wounded pigeon. The grandfather asks the kid to show it to him. But running past him, the kid tells him that this is a gift from the gods. So he'll be eating it alone. Oh man, the vegans won't like this. But the grandfather once again hits him and tells him that it's not just a mere pigeon, but instead a jay falcon, a sacred animal known as the king of the skies, still not getting the point. The kid tells his grandpa that the animal is grub as long as it's dead. But the grandfather makes him realize that a juror falcon is a loyal falcon that follows its owner to death if it has to. So, will he starve for some time and save a life? Or, shall he eat the falcon? Making the right decision. So, Mu decides to save the animal. Following his grandpa's instructions, the kid begins preparing herbal medicine and then applying it to birds wound and just like that. Within a few days, the king of the skies returns to soaring high on the horizon. 
pleading its loyalty to the kid. The falcon sits on his hands, ecstatic to see the coolness of the bird. The kid decides to give it a name. Recalling their first meeting, he remembers that the first time he saw the bird, it had blood running through its iron-like face. So he'll name him Iron Blood. As some days pass by, the old man tells the kid that now that he's quite proficient in archery, they should practice a new technique called wolf steps. This is a technique that has been passed down to their family for generations. As the name suggests, wolves inspire the technique. Curious. The kid asks if there are plenty of other techniques too. To answer that, the grandpa tells him that there's the defensive technique, cloud step, that is used by the Myodang faction. Then there's also the offensive technique, frostbite step, used by the Emi faction. Now taking a few steps back, the grandpa asks Samoon to watch closely. Following this statement, standing in a frog-like stance, he's able to cover all the distance between himself and his grandson in one jump. Giving some more demonstration, the grandpa uses this technique and hops around the place. However, Samoon isn't too excited about learning this technique, as he feels embarrassed to see his grandfather jump here and there like a frog. After giving the demonstration, he asks his grandson about how it is. Giving a fake reaction, the kid smiles and tells his grandpa that it's great. But catching on to his lie, the grandfather decides to give it another way so that he can understand the practicality of the skill. Once again, stepping into his stance, the grandfather jumps right at the kid. Scared by the sheer amount of intimidating force, he's left too stunned to even react, not realizing that he's peed himself. Not gonna lie, if I saw a wolf-like shadow jumping at me, I'd piss myself too. Grunting, the grandpa yells at the kid to stop acting so cocky if he's scared by something like this. Coming back to his senses, baffled, Samoon asks what that was. Having his interest piqued, he decides to give it a shot and asks his grandfather what that was. Looking at him with a serious expression, he explains that wolf's step not only imitates a wolf's movement, but also its vigor. If a wolf's hunting technique would be observed, you'd notice that a wolf first paralyzes its enemy's movements through his bloodlust. Once within attacking range, in one clean attack, the wolf strikes its prey in its vital region, rendering it incapable of escaping or countering. The grandpa further goes on to tell the kid that when he emitted a little bloodlust at him, he couldn't move. So, if it was to be an actual fight, he'd be already dead by now. Awestruck, the kid looks on at his grandfather with starry eyes. To further emphasize the benefit of using this technique, the grandfather questions what was the distance between him and the kid before he jumped. Not paying much attention, he answers that it was approximately 30 feet and then, it suddenly hits him that since he was so focused on his frog-like stance, he completely dismissed the fact that he just covered 30 feet in a single jump. Giving more information, the grandpa tells him that a wolf step is something that should be used defensively. Surprised, Samoon questions if it should only be used for running away. Responding in a scolding tone, he asks the kid what he's going to do with a bow by running after the enemy. Smack him with the bow or stab him with the arrow. Since the wolf step allows its user to travel at super speed, it can be used to either increase the said distance between the user and the enemy or decrease the distance. He further explains to his grandson that if he chased an enemy whilst emitting bloodlust, he'd be scared. So the wolf step is an effective way to maintain a safe distance, while also being an attacking range. Telling his grandson that to see is to believe, he asks him to watch closely his footsteps and ingrain it into his body. Following that, the old man begins to move around the kid and his footwork seems like flowing water. Watching this, the kid wonders how every time he takes a step a footstep is left. 180 steps in different directions. Seeing this, the kid is impressed. Now, following his grandfather's instruction, Samoon begins stepping in the same direction. However, getting confused by the extravagant amount of instructions being thrown his way, he keeps failing, but not giving up at any cost. The kid keeps training till evening. After spending countless nights in training after about a week, at last he's able to successfully do the wolf step once. Seeing this, the grandfather is absolutely amazed as he realizes his grandson's prodigal talent, since he recalls that it took him a month and a half and his father one month to master this technique. But not going easy on him, he still scolds him and tells him that it's pathetic that such an easy technique took him a week. 
Asian Parenting 101. Never show your son that you're proud. Continuing his training in the mountains. Samoon begins practicing a new technique. Just then, the grandfather slips up about how amazed he is with the kid's skill, since he's doing so well despite having his inner key limited by him. Reminds me of when Goku would wear clothes that weighed a ton just so he can kick some enemy but without M. Let's see how OP this MC gets. Hearing that, the kid quickly raises an eyebrow. However, using his sweet talk, the old man subverts the topic and makes the kid believe that he finds it hard to master mental cultivation because his heart sutra visualization isn't being utilized. Getting lost in the big words, the kid continues to focus on his training. Now standing in a shallow flowing river, he balances some rocks on his shoulders and head whilst walking slower than a snail. Despite failing many times, he stays at it and at last is finally able to balance everything without fail. Having mastered the mind cultivation, the grandpa takes him to a vast place and as the autumn wind blows past them, he asks his grandchild to use the wolf's step. Taking heed to his orders, the kid quickly does so. Seeing his skills have improved so much with key limitation, the grandpa becomes certain that it's time his training was turned up a notch. Taking him to a seemingly harmless cave, the grandpa tells him that this is where they'll train from now on. While Samoon will be trapped inside trying to survive against the beasts, the grandpa will take the responsibility of feeding him. However, seeing a chained up wolf growling at him, he is overtaken by fear. But not going easy on his grandson, the old man reminds him that he has wolf step and much more techniques at his disposal. It's time that he learned the difference between reality and training. Saying this, the grandpa shoots a key blast at Wolf's chain, freeing the beast and closing the door for good. I'm sure the old man is trying to kill his grandson. As the door closes, Samoon panics as it's too dark for him to see anything. Continuously knocking on the door, he asks his granddad to let him out. However, simply looking forth, he the granddad thinks to himself that even though it's hard, he must endure it. Feeling violent gaze at him, the kid turns back suddenly, only to find that the wolf has gotten a lot closer. Once again, hitting the door as hard as he can, he asks his grandfather to open the door, since what kind of a granddad feeds his only family to wolves? Trust me dude, there are people doing way crazier stuff. However, it's too late now and the kid is now in the wolf's range. As the furious beast jumps at him, scared, he has no option but to escape using the wolf's step. However, one dodge isn't enough to keep the persistent animal away. Jumping from side to side, the kid keeps on dodging. But soon enough he realizes that he needs to find an opening and deal some real damage since at the rate things are going. He'll be dog food in a few seconds. Denji would be proud to be that as long as it's from Akima. So this time, taking a firm stance, the kid stands right in front of harm's way and as the vile beast jumps to sink its teeth in his skin, he is finally able to find an opening and land a clean palm strike. Getting hit like that, the wolf too realizes that the kid is no joke and for the time being, takes a step back. Now using the free time he has, the kid sits down and begins practicing his cultivation technique to regain stamina. Dying of thirst, the only source of water he's left with is a water seepage in the roof of the cave. And after a long wait, finally, the light shines on our MC as a small part of the door opens and his grandfather throws in the meal. Unfortunately, before Samoon can get to it, the wolf jumps at it and gouges it down. Pouting at the animal's selfish act, the kid tells it that it must feel great eating such a delicious meal all alone. Since then, for days have passed and the only thing that the kid has been able to consume is tiny droplets of water falling from the roof. Finally, acknowledging that he has to be faster than the wolf to survive, the kid begins to materialize his plan. Playing possum, he acts to fall asleep while practicing his usual cultivation technique, not using much of its brain as the wolf sneaks up to Sao Moon in hopes of devouring him. He suddenly jumps and manages to gain a lot of distance between them. Just then, the small door is opened again and the food is thrown inside. This time, being closer to the meal, he at once jumps at it and begins gouging it down. Observing the scenario from outside, the grandfather appreciates his grandchild for accomplishing this task. Just as he opens the door, he finds his grandkids sleeping on top of the wolf's belly, whilst the growling beast is left tied up in ropes. 
unable to do anything. Please, nobody asks me in the comments that does it hurt the animal. Waking up, the kid complains to his grandpa that he left him alone. However, the grandpa replies that it was fruitful training and nothing more. Well, at least the kid can call his grandpa out. If it was mine here, right now, he'd be using all the techniques on me as demonstration. Not paying much attention to his grandfather's message. The kid dismisses everything and tries to leave. However, the grandfather then tells him that it's only the start of his training. After having acknowledged him for mastering the wolf step, his grandfather then tells him that he must also master the psych now. Well, he did use the wolf step. He didn't immobilize his enemies with striking fear in their hearts. So, for the next 100 days, he'll stay here with wolves and every day a new wolf will be sent in along with no food. So, he must survive on his own and fight to the best of his capabilities. Leaving him with only a dagger, the old man once again leaves. Old man really does want his grandson eaten as it appears so. Taking on the challenge, the kid sits in there with Bravo. Just like those four days pass by and four wolves enter the cave. Sitting there with his eyes peeled. Samoon wonders how he's going to tackle this obstacle. Just then the four wolves run towards him. However, using his intimidating aura, the kid pushes them back. Seeing as to there is no other option, the wolves decide to attack the weakest among them and feast on it. Looking on, the kid wonders if this is the battle key his grandfather mentioned. Too hungry to even think straight, the kid dashes towards the wolves so that he can also have some wolf meat. Once again, the vegans aren't gonna like this one. Seeing the kid try and take away their meal, the wolves lash out too and jump towards him. Not being able to catch up to the wolf's speed, he's bit on his arm. However, remaining calm, he pushes off the wolf and grunts in pain. But there isn't enough time for him to deal with his wounds, as the bloodthirsty wolves are still in pursuit of his flesh. Now taking a solid stance once again this time. Samoon lets the wolf make the first move and just as the creature's horrifying teeth are about sink deep into his arm, he plunges his dagger right into its neck, killing it for good. Too hungry to explore other options, he immediately skins the wolf and begins devouring its meat. Since then, 100 days have passed by and only 5 wolves remain, because some were killed by the pack of wolves, while other by none other than our protagonist. But now to make it out of here alive, you must kill the leader of the pack. Taking on this challenge, the red-eyed wolf charges towards Samoon and manages to ground him with his teeth sunken deep into his left arm. However, not giving up into the pain and fear, Samoon plunges his dagger right into the wolf's skull. As blood seeps out of it, so does the wolf's soul leave his body. Now up on his feet once again, Samoon looks at the remaining wolves with bloodthirsty eyes. Not wasting any time, he leaps into the air and unleashes a powerful attack, sending all the wolves to their demise. Worried about the sudden silence in the cave, his grandfather calls out to him trying to make sure his grandson is all right. Upon getting the confirmation, he takes a sigh of relief and wipes off his tears. Oh, now you're worried. Taking his grandson back to their place, he patches up his wounds and gives him medicines to drink. However, Anubishu arises when Samoon realizes that iron blood isn't coming near him, due to his consistent bloodlust. So, in hopes of controlling it, he asks his grandfather about it, realizing that he must limit his key. Samoon once again undergoes training under the dimly lit sky with a cold atmosphere. Sitting underneath the waterfall, he calms his mind as he tries to cultivate his heart sutra. Sitting under the cold water, Samoon tries to empty his head from all thoughts. However, unable to do so he loses control of his key and begins to go into shock due to sheer cold from the waterfall. Scared, his grandfather begins to worry if Samoon is going to fall ill. However, not wasting another second, Samoon decides to go all out. Upon hearing his grandfather's advice of letting his key flow rather than forcing it, he's able to take control of himself. Now, after having completed the training session, the two return home. Going into Vincennes mode, the grandfather explains to the kid that the Heart Sutra virtualization was a technique formed and perfected by monks instead of warriors. They would focus on emptying their thoughts because the things we own end up owning us. Moving forth, the grandfather then tells, back when the monks used this technique for the first time, 
They came out to be far stronger than the warriors who had been drowning in lust for power. So that's why his grandfather wanted to make sure he trained the Heart Sutra virtualization at a young age, before the worldly desires could take over his heart. Continuing his practice, one fine day, his grandfather notices Samoon not only attaining the triple apex flower, but also the five key awakening, the highest power there is within the Heart Sutra virtualization. Seeing this, he begins to cry tears of joy, as he realizes that all of the training has led to this fruitful result. Now as the two take a walk under the fleeting sun, Samoon's grandfather tells him that even though he was thinking of starting his proper training from now on, there wouldn't be any need. But being the idiot he is, Samoon asks confusedly about what does he mean. To answer that, the grandpa tells him that he's learned everything there was to teach, besides he was able to achieve something that people can't do even after training all their lives. Hearing this at last, Samoon jumps in happiness. Several years pass by then and Samoon continues to polish his archery skill. Sitting with his grandfather, he mentions of how he's never missed a shot in his entire life. However, his grandfather replies back that the pinnacle of archery is formless archery and a key guided arrow. But Samoon only takes it as a joke since the idea sounds ridiculous to him. However, his grandfather then mentions an interesting fact that the 17th archer in their ancestry was able to master the bow to perfection. After asking Samoon of his age, which turns out to be 17, he asks him to travel to their patriarch village hidden high in the mountains. There he must find the secrets to the art of Wu Wei and Triple Unity Sword style, leaving him with a book about inner key cultivation written by their ancestors. His grandfather asks him to leave. Damn man, I feel like my life will end before Samoon's training does. Now standing on top of the hill at his patriarch village, Samoon prostrates and asks his ancestors for their continued guidance before jumping off of it whilst holding a rope. As he's scaling down the ginormous mountain, he comes across a small entrance. Jumping into it, he immediately senses an overwhelming amount of bloodlust. However, not giving in to the intimidation, he replies with some bloodlust enhanced by the Heart Sutra virtualization itself. Getting closer and closer to the source, he suddenly feels a blast of key at him, pushing him back. After several attempts of pushing through it, he at last sits down in despair thinking about his next move. Just then, a light shine from the entrance further into the cave. Following the light, Samoon enters into a room with three drawings hanging from the ceiling, surprised by the amount of key that was flowing from them. Samoon takes cautious steps as he stumbles upon a small wooden trunk. Opening it, he finds in there a wooden bow that although may seem light, it weighs nothing less than a hundred pounds. Putting the weapon aside for a while since it's too heavy to use, Samoon finds a catalog. Reading through the pages, he finds his ancestor addressing to the reader of the diary, introducing himself as Yul G. Hyuk a 40-year-old man at the time of writing this. Even though he was proficient in archery, he ended up loving swords more than a bow. Since then, he spent 20 years learning the blade and at the end of all this time, he was able to finally create the triple unity sword style, which he believed to be the strongest sword style ever. Reading this, Samoon mentions what an egotistical guy. But I think we can agree that ego is something that runs in his family. Flipping through the page, Samoon suddenly notices a change in handwriting. Reading through the text, a new character is introduced, Yalju Mujiak. Unlike his grandfather, who happened to be the creator of the Triple Unity Sword style, he didn't share the love for the sword, or rather a bow. Thus, following his own path, he made his own sword style and tried taking on the first scroll that included the key for path to Wu Wei. However, when matched up against it, he couldn't deal any damage and realized that the sword style had transcended to divinity and had become the peerless unity style. Hence impressed by it, he perfected his archery and taking inspiration from the sword style, he was able to create his own technique, formless firing. A technique that allows you to combine key with the arrow and shoot it, reading you free of carrying any arrows. Hearing this, Samoon is baffled, as he realizes that his grandfather wasn't bluffing to him, but actually serious. You gotta start putting some respect on your grandfather's name, boy. Continuing his reading, Samoon finally realizes that three scroll are a combination of all the techniques that his ancestors came up with. So, to leave the cave stronger and more OP than ever, 
he has to make sure all three scrolls are destroyed. Picking up the bow, Samoon decides to give Formless Firing a shot first. However, while unable to handle its weight, he decides to learn the path to Wu Wei first. So, sitting in the cave, he begins to meditate and after some days have passed by, he's finally able to get a hang of it. Gathering the two keys that he's learned, the Heart Sutra Cultivation and Wu Wei, Samoon sits patiently. However, this suddenly goes wrong for him as soon the kids begin colliding his body. Realizing that this is bad, he wonders if he should quit training for now or keep going on. As he recalls his grandpa's advice telling him to quit whenever the two key clash, since many of his ancestors were crippled due to this, but still not giving in to the risk of death or lifelong injury. Samoon continues to try and control, but realizing there's no other way to go, he raises his heart sutra visualization key and circulates the path to Wu Wei, allowing the two to merge with each other. The sheer amount of key suddenly begins emitting an aura of red and blue from Samoon's eyes and body, making him scream out in pain, as he yells that his body is about to burst. For a moment, the negativity gets to him as he thinks that this was a bad idea. However, reminding himself that it's do or die at this point, he continues finally managing to overcome the obstacle and carry two keys simultaneously. Taking a sigh of relief, suddenly Samoon realizes that he's floating in the air now just by thinking of standing up. My man, that skills. Now getting on with the next step, he begins training formless firing as he picks up the heavy bow and goes outside, spending a fortnight in the forest. Samoon quickly gets a hang of the technique and advances on to the next step, peerless sword style. Going back into the cave, he carves out a wooden sword and tries to understand how to use it. Despite not touching a sword his entire life, wondering what to do, he looks at the scrolls for an explanation. Just then, the sword comes flying out of it right in his direction, dodging it at the last second. Samoon lives to breathe another day. However, followed in quick succession, a second sword comes for his head from the second scroll. Barely managing to dodge it, Samoon stands cautiously as he waits for the third scroll that happens to release electrifying key. That Samoon is able to block using his wooden sword. Remember guys, that's because wood is an insulator. Seeing this, Samoon concludes that the first scroll portrays swiftness, the second deception and the third one is the key of the full moon and all these three scrolls were set here by his ancestors. Man seems like his ancestors were really hellbent on killing their offsprings. Seeing his reaction to all these attacks, Samoon realizes that it's the sky-high blade form for which the path to Wu Wei was created in the first place. Now knowing what to do, Samoon spends countless nights honing his skills and just like that a year and four months pass by. After all this time, he's only able to cut down two of the scrolls, leaving only the third, but still unable to do so. Samoon keeps on practicing the peerless blade technique and at last, Two years and three months later, he challenges himself again. Using the first step of the peerless sword style, he initiates the thoughtless blade, cutting through the first scroll cleanly. Then, loveless blade, he's able to cut through the second scroll and at last, using the third step, endless blade. He slashes all of the three scrolls, finally ending his journey. Paying his respects to his ancestors, Samoon once again heads back to his grandfather. Now after getting back home, Samoon simply lies down and rests. Seeing this, his grandfather scolds him and tells him to have aspirations. However, Samoon replies that his aspiration is to spend life this way by basking in the sun all day and eating to the fullest. Relatable than MC before. Hearing this, the grandfather gets furious and brings down his stick upon Samoon. But things are different now, as Samoon easily dodges his attacks and is also able to block with a mere finger. Oh, how the tables have turned. Later at night, as the two sit in silence inside of their home, Samoon's grandfather tells him that he won't tell him what to do anymore, but he should at least get a wife and then settle down. This man's twenty and talks of him getting married had already begun. Meanwhile, I'm here narrating man was at twenty. A man. I'm sobbing. However, sighing in despair, Samoon replies that there aren't any women in this mountain. But to his surprise, his grandfather informs him that his wife is in Janun. Further explaining his statement, his grandfather tells him that a long time ago, when Samoon was only four, he made acquaintance with the head of the Sichuan family, 
the strongest family in the Sichuan region and one of the five mightiest families in Zhanyuan, providing Samun with an artifact known as the Jade Plaque. His grandfather asks him to show this to the Sichuan family, so they can know he's their son-in-law. Imagine having raised so bad, your grandson arranges your marriage. After that, his grandfather also gives him a book by the name of Tom of the Head Sutra and asks him to return it back to Shaolin Temple on the way back. Now finding ourselves back in the forest, we find a young warrior trying to get away from a crowd of soldiers at full speed. However, unable to keep up with the fatigue and wounds, his course collapses down. With no other option in sight, the soldier decides to put down his course. R.I.P. Horse, you'll be missed. Now surrounded with no escape, the warrior finds himself in the presence of Taru, the chief of Bay Tribe. Being merciful, Taru offers the warrior the option of surrendering, so that he may be spared. However, the young warrior immediately rejects that offer and pulls out his sword. Without fear, he charges at the Taru and the two clash swords. Taru then takes another powerful swing that the warrior is barely able to dodge. But before the realization of death looming around him can set in, Taru knocks the sword out of his hands, leaving him defenseless. Praising the young warrior for his skills, he asks his name. In response, the young warrior introduces himself as the Yakuo tribe's vice chief, Guyak. Ashamed of failing his duties, Guyak asks Taru for an honorable death. Upholding his honor, Taru also agrees. Kinda feel like Taru is a good man. Sitting prepared for his demise, Ryuk sits calmly as Taru pulls his blade back to behead him. Just then, an arrow comes flying at Taru, striking him right in the shoulder. Enraged, he yells and questions who is there, jumping out of the shadows. Samoon stands in front of him as he tells him that it's not good for so many people to attack a single person. Introducing himself, Taru asks Samoon who he is. However, giving a vague response, he simply tells the group that he's just a sleepy man awoken by this ruckus. Angry at this blasphemous comment, Taru's underlings ask Samoon to kneel. But being the badass he is, he shoots an arrow right into the guy's knee asking him to kneel himself. Pretty savage, standing firm and strong. Samoon, with his bloodlust rising by the moment, asks Taru to stand down or else everyone dies. A couple of moments later, all of the attackers are left tied up with a tree. Now finally out of harm's way, Guyak thanks Samoon, curious as to the situation. Samoon asks him why they were trying to kill him since they seem to be from the same tribe. To explain that Gugyak responded that he's a part of the Jenjo Jurchens while the others were a part of the Hiaxi Jurchens. Since there have been some intertribal battles, the relationships are complicated. Gugyak then asks Samoon where he's headed and after hearing that, he'll be heading to the Shaolin Temple and then Sichuan. He tells Samung that it'll take five to six months to get there. Hearing this, Samun yells in frustration as he recalls his grandfather saying that it'll only take a couple of months. I feel like everything this grandfather tells him is a lie. To repay Samun for his kindness, he asks him to visit their village first to Ristok before heading out. Riding through the forest, Samun and Guyak exchange his pleasantries. Just then, a battalion of soldiers comes running straight at them. Preparing for battle, Samoon asks Guyak if they're his enemies. However, upon hearing that it's just his men that were looking for him, Samoon calms down. Calling out to the chief, Guyak bows down in embarrassment as he apologizes for the death of the hundred men due to him. However, without putting the blame on anyone, the chief tells him that they all died an honorable death since they died for their tribe. Taking notice of Samoon standing right next to him, he asks who he is. Answering the question, Guyuk tells him that it's the guy who saved his life with his perfect archery skills. The way Samoon's becoming a celebrity here, he may just find a wife at Guyuk's camp. Hearing this, the chief introduces himself as Marinanta and shows his gratitude for saving Guyuk's life. Heading back to the tribe's camp, Guyuk assigns one of his soldiers, Masad to serve Samoon the time he's here. Keeping a formal attitude, Mossad keeps addressing Samoon as Mr. However, annoyed by the formalities, he asks Mossad to keep it cool and only call him Young Nim, since he's younger than him. Now resting in a camp, Mossad and Samoon exchange words. 
The conversation allows him to learn that there are two authorities in Zhang Yuan. One of them is ruled by the Emperor, while the other is ruled by a society of Murim warriors known as the Gango. But of course, our dumb Samun isn't able to understand the concept fully in things that Zhang Yan is divided by a country by the name of Gango in the Ming Dynasty. However, Masa reiterates himself and tells that Gango is actually just a group of Murim warriors in the Ming Dynasty. Just then, with a serious expression on his face, Gu Yuk enters inside of the tent and tells So Mun that he believes war is about to rage again. Unfazed by the dreadful news, So Mun turns back slowly and asks if it's actually true, since it's been quiet for a few months. Famous last words, Gu Yuk then responds that the Bahi tribe has already reached Mount Meta that happens to be only 20 miles away. As Gu Yuk heads out to certain death, so Mun stoically advises him to come back in one piece. Wow, Sherlock. I thought he must have been dying to come back in pieces, literally. Worried about Gu Yuk, Samun asks Mossad if the Bahi tribe is strong. In response, Mossad answers that it is three times stronger than the Yakuo, so in an all-out war it would be a huge disadvantage. As the two armies stand against each other staring at their deaths, Samun mentions that the Bahi being this strong doesn't sound good. Then in just one flash, the armies begin charging towards each other. Still confident in their ability, Gu Yuk's tribe mentions that even though they are lesser in number, they're still more skilled. Well, famous last words, because Gu Yuk's tribes start to get absolutely massacred in the start of the battle. Realizing that the situation is grim, Samun asks Mossad to bring some branches and begins carving them out in the shape of an arrow, standing on top of a cliff. Samun takes aim and even though he didn't want to kill anyone to prevent any more deaths, he snags the arrow right into an enemy soldier's arm that was about to kill Guyak. Noticing the wounded soldier, Guyak reverts his attention to him and strikes him with his sword. Assessing the situation, Samun then notices another fierce warrior of the enemy forces, who, sitting on top of a horse, is massacring several men of Guyak's army, thinking to himself that to kill a serpent, his head must be cut. Samun takes aim and then shoots his arrow in his direction. As the vile warrior raises his blade to cut through the several foot soldiers, suddenly, Samun's arrow strikes him right in the heart, sending him to his demise. Seeing this, enemy soldiers are left shocked. I think we should name Samun the White Death. If you guys don't know who he is, search it up. You'll be shocked. However, not giving the enemy a chance to settle, Samun hits a multi-shot killing several soldiers simultaneously. Noticing the blistering speed of the arrows, Mossad is left shocked and impressed. While several of the enemy soldiers fall down injured or dead, Gumiak's army suddenly get a boost of morale when they realize that the reinforcements are here. Seeing the now fired up army charging at them at full speed, the body tribe chief gives a frightened yet furious expression as he takes notice of Samun. Standing next to him, the vice chief, Babu tells him that he's the guy that single-handedly defeated all his battalion. Hearing this, even the chief accepts that he's never seen such a powerful and frightening display with a bow. However, Baba reminds him that he must not get impressed right now since their cavalry must fall back and rally them. But in a disappointed voice, the chief tells him that there will be no need for that, since they've already lost the battle due to their soldiers' low morale. So, with no other option left, the best tactic right now is to simply retreat. Hearing this, Bado gives his men the order to retreat, whilst the Baha'i tribe chief is left thinking how terrifying the idea of a single archer changing the outcome of the war is. It's the first time ever that I've seen a character that actually takes the first cue not to mess with an overpowered protagonist. Good going, mate. Yes, you heard the boss music playing. When so moves showed up, Trumpets are then blown from the enemy side, signifying defeat and retreat. Hearing the sweet sound of victory, all the soldiers scream out in happiness. Whilst Masid also happily tells Samun that they've been keeping a stoic voice, Samun simply tells him that they should get back now. Now back at the camp, soldiers begin drinking and feasting, as they describe the victory as one of the most exhilarating experiences of their life due to how the enemies were panicking. Meanwhile, as Samoon enters the camp, Gu Yuk with a wide smile comes out running to Samoon and calls out his name. Seeing his friend alive, Samoon smiles and tells him he's glad to see him back in one piece. But kneeling down, Gu Yuk tells him that it's all thanks to his archery, 
and that his father and the other war generals are waiting for him at the celebratory party. However, too tired after shooting so many arrows, Samoon tells him that he'll visit them later as he'd like to rest now. Dang, I guess when Samoon was born, it was the doctor that got spanked. Respecting Samoon's wishes, he lets him go. But as Samoon walks, he notices all of the village being burned down and several women being lashed by soldiers as they are left defenseless. Seeing this with an enraged expression, Samoon asks who these guys are, to which Masa replies that they are the Yaku soldiers, grunting. Samoon asks that why are they taking the villagers captive and burning their house if they already won the battle. In response, Masa tells him that apparently someone from the village helped the Bahi tribe. Still not seeing the point, Samoon tells Masad that they should only capture the person that helped the Bahi and not those that were innocent. Why are they being captured? In response, Masa tells Samoon that it is so that they can be enslaved and then sold. Hearing this, Samoon's anger increases even more after realizing how cruel this is. Admitting his bloodlust, he tells Mossad that they are heading to the party after all. As Samoon heads into the party, he finds several villagers tied up there and one that's about to be beheaded. But before the sword can cut through the villager's head, Samoon asks the soldiers, stop that. Alerted by this insolent tone, the generals look in the direction the voice came from only to find Samoon there. Not realizing the situation, they welcome him with open arms and show gratitude for helping them win the battle. But not paying attention to their words nor caring about them. Samoon asks the higher-ups why they are killing and enslaving innocent people when the war is over. They should let them go at once. But the war chief hearing that simply laughs as he claims that even though Samoon's skill with the bow is excellent, he lacks a firm heart. That's because he has no enemies, guys. Comment down below where this reference is from. In a mocking tone, he tells Samoon he understands where he's coming from but nothing can be done. So he should sit with them and have a drink. Not finding anything funny, Samoon this time with I will rip your throat out with my teeth looks at the general and says that he beseeches that these people must be given freedom. Just then a sword is plunged into the ground at that very moment and a guy yell how dare he say something like that. Does he not know who he's standing in front of? However, not intimidated in slightest, Samoon just gives a bombastic side eye. Looking in his direction, Samoon sees a gigantic and muscular man who happens to be a general of the Yakua tribe. Carrying his berserker-style sword, he gives Samoon the criminal offensive side eye and tells him that his achievements don't mean that he has to be pardoned for such modesty. So, he asks him to leave at once. Calming down the situation, the chief tells him to let it be since Samoon is the one due to who they won this battle. However, letting his sense of pride and ego take over, he curses Samoon and tells him that his unremarkable archery isn't something he should be proud of. Some people just really want to get hooped. Guyuk also intervenes as he reminds the general that it was due to Samoon that they came out as the victors today. However, the general asks Guyuk to stay out of this since according to him, disrespecting the chieftain means to disrespect all of the Yaku tribe, acting more and more out of control by the moment. The general orders his men to capture Samoon and take him away. As the men approach, Samoon, armed to the teeth, is simply emitting his bloodlust and tells them to screw off. This mere statement is enough to send a shiver down the soldiers' spines and make them rethink their decision. So, the general decides to take matters into his own hands, as he claims that he's just as good with the dagger as Samoon is with the bow. Taking out of the daggers from his armor, he throws it at Samoon. Seeing this, the chief immediately get frightened as they realize that the general has crossed a line you shouldn't have. However, Unfazed by the dagger coming straight for his chest, Samoon simply stares down his opponents. Just then, fearing for his master's life, Masa jumps in front of the dagger and gets struck right in the middle of his chest. Going limp, he falls into Samoon's arms, while Samoon out of worry asks Masa to keep it together. In a muffled whisper like voice, Mossad laughs and tells Samoon that his body just moved on his own. Seeing his friend bleeding to death, Samoon screams out in pain. However, being the kind soul that he is, as tears drip down from Mossad's eyes, he tells Samoon to keep smiling, since he looks best when he's smiling. Giving in to his request, Samoon tells him that he'll smile as long as he doesn't die. However, 
The light quickly begins to fade away from Mossad's eyes as he utters his last words. It's been a pleasure knowing you. Mossad, you were a good friend and an even better human. Seeing one of his first ever friends pass away, Samoon yells out his name looking at the heavens. However, that is soon followed out by fury and rage, emitting bloodlust to his maximum capability. He takes out the dagger from Mossad's heart and tells the general, let's see you catch this and before the general can react, the dagger is taken across the general's skull, all the way down to his legs, cutting him in half like a torn paper. However, still not having his wrath fully unleashed, Somu kneels that he's going to end all of the Yaku tribe, saying that he unleashes the peerless triple unity blade, endless blade and kills all those he opposes, leaving only Gyu Yuk. Seeing this, Gyu Yuk falls to his knees as he cries and calls out Samoon. Hearing his saddened voice, Samoon looks back and tells him that he'll never forget him and was sad. Saying this, he bids farewell to him and heads out once again. As a solo player, whilst Gyu Yuk on his knees cries and tells Samoon that he'll always be waiting for his return. For days later, as Samoon is traveling all alone, he comes across none other than Iron Blood. Seeing a message with him, he opens the small paper and reads it out. The message is none other than from his beloved lying grandfather. Mentioning that since Iron Blood was getting lonely, he's sending him and he also mentions that Samoon needs to get back as soon as possible, since he can't be bothered cooking for himself. Reading this with frustration, Samoon throws the letter away and carries on with his journey. Now inside of a jungle, he decides to hunt down a tiger. However, as he's taking aim to put it down, the tiger takes notice of Samoon's presence and comes running at him. Not afraid of the deadly tiger, using his formless firing technique, Samoon shoots a key arrow at it, killing the tiger instantly. Carrying the heavy tiger corpse, Samoon is able to reach Beijing. However, hidden under the gigantic tiger, it seems as if the animal is walking on two feet. All the shoppers stand in horror, fearing for their life, until Samoon finally drops the corpse and shouts out that the dead tiger is for sale. Without wasting a moment, the people gather around it and start bidding for the fresh tiger. The price starts from 10 gold coins until it goes higher and higher. Grinning, Samoon thinks to himself that he just wanted to make a little money to cover his food expenses, but it's going a lot better than he expected. Suddenly, an old man takes notice of the tiger and observes it closely. After confirming the tiger to be in good condition, he offers Samoon a whopping amount of 200 gold coins. Hearing this, Samoon's eyes bulge out in shock. When is this going to happen with my broke ass? I'm sobbing right now, guys. However, before Samoon can process this information, the old man throws the gold coin in his direction and heads off with the tiger. Having earned a pretty good amount of money, Samoon goes to Man Inlu, a high-end restaurant. But judging Samoon from his rugged clothes, the waiter at the door asks Samoon to go away, since he thinks it isn't a place that he'll be able to afford. However, he's left shocked when Samoon hands him the gold coin. Stang missed much money. The waiter immediately changes his attitude and begins addressing him as sir and seats him, offering him a wide variety of food. The waiter informs Samoon of the delicacies that are best served at Man in Lu. Just then, Samoon, while ripping through duck meat, asks the waiter to bring him some new clothes. Damn, even narrating this is making me hungry. As he heads off to buy some clothes for Samoon, he hands him another gold coin. Having earned two years' worth of salary in a year, the waiter ecstatically goes to buy clothes, Samoon really out here flexing his wealth. After a while of surfing through the finest materials, the waiter brings out clothes made of pure silk that are best attributed to a warrior. Now sitting with the waiter, Samoon asks him if Sichuan is far from here. In response, the waiter tells him that the road there is long and very harsh and especially difficult for those that are heading there for the first time. However, there are certain people that frequently travel there. Having his curiosity piqued, Samoon immediately questions who these people are. So, the waiter tells him that it's an escort agency that often guard high authority personnel, navigate through such difficult areas, or carry important goods. So, no matter how dangerous it is, as long as it is within the bounds of Xiong Yuan, those guys will go anywhere. Suddenly, the waiter asks Samoon if he's a martial artist himself. After getting a confirmation from him, 
He then suggests that you should apply for the role of a warden, since all the expenses for a warden are covered. Now, once again, out in the market, Samoon walks around in his new clothes and boy, oh boy, is our Samoon looking hot, looking for the Thousand Mile Escort Agency. Samoon looks here and there, but being the big dummy he is, he forgets the directions for it. So, calling out to Iron Blood, he asks him to search for the agency. Fortunately, since Iron Blood isn't as stupid as Samoon, he quickly finds out where the agency is and helps Samoon get there. As Samoon enters the agency, he's suddenly stopped by the receptionist who asks him what he's doing here. Ignorant of what's going on, Samoon simply tells him that he's here for a job. However, the receptionist tells him that the trials for wardens are already over, so he'll just have to come at another time. Talking in an apologetic tone, Samoon tries to bargain with him by telling him that he's come from a really far place, so he can't go back. But not giving in to Samoon's tactics, he simply tells him that he should have come earlier then. However, still not giving up, Samoon asks him when the next trials will take place. Keeping a stern attitude, the guy tells him that there's no set date, since more wardens will only be needed when there will be more jobs. But staying persistent, Samoon asks the guy to let him help out with odd tasks until then. Seeing Samoon's desperation, he at last offers him the work of a handyman. Even though Samoon isn't very pleased with that position, he has no option but to accept it. Well, beggars can't be choosers. Two months pass since then, and before Samoon heads out on his tenth journey, one handyman asks him why he's always carrying a bow, like keeping his proficiency with a bow a secret. He simply tells that it is just an heirloom. Now as the escort agency travels through the beautifully snow-capped mountains, one of the wardens warns his colleague. Warden Sode cautions him to be extra careful. However, Sode mentions that, since they have over 30 experienced wardens, there's no need to worry. Once again, I'll say famous last words. As the caravan travels deeper into the forest, one of the wardens asks the caravan captain regarding what is the shortest path. In response, he tells him that if they were to keep heading south, then they'd reach precipitous cliffs of Mount Chongyam. However, there's also a different path through Hanum that will take four days. Seeing the shortage of time, the warden decides that they must keep heading south so that they can travel in time. However, the caravan captain tells them that the only problem that lies on this path is a place called the Tiger's Mouth Denver. The last warden that traveled through here had some complications. Taking heed from the captain's advice, the warden leader asks everyone to be on guard as they enter the Tiger's Mouth Denver. Two of the wardens talking with each other mention how it would be better if bandits showed up, since it would make the journey interesting at least. Just then, Samoon takes notice of bloodlust coming from his left side. Quickly anticipating the size of the bandit fleet, Samoon realizes that they are twice the number of the wardens. Suddenly, the warden leader asks the caravan to stop and a horde of men block their path. The leader of the bandits takes notice that the Thousand Mile Agency is traveling through. In response, the warden leader introduces himself as Li Jin. Giving back the warm gesture, the bandit leader, showing his respects, introduces himself as Juriak Wong, noticing that he's a man of respect. Li Jin asks why he blocked his path then. To answer that, Wong replies that recently due to the heavy rain, their fences have broken down. So, they didn't come to block their path, but rather check who it is. Here, Matt, Li Jin being the respectable man he is, pulls out some gold coins to help out Wong fix the fence. Just then a commotion occurs and an all-out fight breaks out between the bandits and the wardens. Seeing as how the fighting has already started, the leaders to begin fighting from their respective groups. The wardens wonder who attacked first, however it doesn't matter now since the fight has already started. So all they have to do is win. Swords, spikes, and weapons of all kinds clash with each other, and while the wardens may have been more experienced and formally trained for battle, due to the overwhelming number of the bandits, more and more of them were getting injured or far worse, killed. Sighing at the situation, Samoon thinks to himself that all this happened due to one inexperienced warden only, since moments earlier a bandit had approached a warden with a friendly intent. The bandit mentioned that since the talks between his boss and the warden's boss are going smoothly, perhaps they should introduce themselves too. However, scared by the bandit's intimidating aura, the warden asks him not to get any closer whilst gripping his sword, 
but still not taking the cue and keeping a friendly demeanor. The bandit introduces himself as Crimson Wolf, Hong Rang, and imitates to growl at the warden. Scared of the bandit, the warden instantly swung his sword, which slashes through poor Hong Rang's chest. People screw me like the warden screw Hong Rang. Feeling sad for my G, now coming back into the present, seeing as how the situation is only getting worse, Samoon climbs on top of the carriage and readies his bow. Unaware of the sheer talent and skill standing in front of him, the caravan captain asks him to come down and not attract any attention, since bandits let the handyman live most of the time. However, in response, Samoon only gives the captain a huge smile and proceeds to take aim. Taking his first shot, he manages to get one guy in the throat. Proceeding, he uses his infamous multi-shot killing several of Wong's men that were guarding him. Distracted by the arrow, Wong asks who is the one shooting these arrows. But just then Li Jin swoops in close and cuts Wong down. Poor Wong seemed like a good guy. Seeing their leader fall, the bandits decide to do a tactical retreat and run back to where they came from. One of the wardens reports 11 casualties and 17 deaths to Li Jin, who feels disappointed about how the outcome of that negotiation turned out. Asking the injured wardens to travel in the wheelbarrow, Li Jin shows his gratitude to Samoon and compliments his archery skills. After asking his name, Li Jin tells him that being a handyman for someone with his caliber of skills is a disgrace. But moving forth with the journey, at last the agency finally reaches their destination and decides to rest up there, until all the wardens are completely healed from their wounds. Now at the agency's residency, as Samoon is passing by, he hears two men talking about the Shaolin Temple. Interrupting their interaction, he asks him if the Shaolin Temple is nearby. One of the workers pointing to a mountain in sight, known as Mount Song, tells Samoon that the Shaolin Temple is there. After inquiring of the distance between Song and the agency's residency, which happens to be 50 miles, Samoon goes and asks his higher-ups permission to travel to the Shaolin Temple. This might just be the first MC, who is so OP yet he still follows the rules. After getting permission from Li Jin, Samoon immediately heads out and reaches Mount Song before nightfall. Sitting on top of a beautiful hill, he notices that the kids play sports here using the Shaolin Temple technique. Now as the sun slowly fades into the horizon, Samoon finally reaches the Shaolin Temple. However, just as he's going to enter the temple, two monks stop him and ask him to come tomorrow, since the time for service is up once the sun is down. Why is Samoon late to everything? Stammering and confused, Samoon tells them that he isn't here to attend the service, but rather to see the patriarch. With a stern expression on his face, one of the monks asks him what his purpose to see the patriarch is. Still not having coming up with an excuse, Samoon replies he simply wants to greet him. Taking notice of Samoon's casual attitude, the monk straight up tells him that the patriarch is no ordinary guy and doesn't beat someone without any concrete reason. Realizing that there's no going past this monk, Samoon with a stern expression on his face tells him that he's Yolji Samoon and he's here regarding the Tome of Heart Sutra. Never having heard of such a tome, the monk asks his fellow if he's ever heard of something like that. However, his answer is also no. Seeing as the matter is something beyond their understanding, they call a senior member who happens to be Yang Gak, the monk responsible for attending to the guests. Conversing with Samoon, he asks if he knows anything regarding the disappearance of the Tome of Heart Sutra. In response, Samoon tells him that yes, he's here regarding the very matter he's speaking about. Hearing this, Yang yells at the top of his lungs, thank the gods. At last, there is some information on the Tome of the Heart Sutra that was stolen from the Shaolin Temple 50 years ago. Hearing the word stolen, Samoon has his senses blown out as he thinks that his grandfather told him that he had borrowed the Tom. This guy a man? I swear to God everything that has come out Samoon's grandfather's mouth has been a lie and he keeps on setting up his grandchild on it. Ecstatic, Yang asks the other monks to bring in the patriarch. Sweating profusely, Samoon then realizes that his grandfather did indeed steal the Tom since what faction would just give away their greatest treasure. Now having no option, Samoon follows Yang to meet the Patriarch. Now sitting with a panel of monks, Samoon is greeted by the Patriarch Yango, who asks him about the information regarding the disappearance of the Tome of Heart Sutra. Nervous, 
Samoon thinks to himself that they'd kill him if they learned that they were responsible for stealing it. Intruding his thought, Yango asks Samoon about it. In response, Samoon tells him that, yes, he indeed does have information about the book. Hearing all the monk praise Buddha in joy and asks him where it is. Taking out the book from his bag, Samoon places it on the table. Seeing the book, Yang Go and all the monks once again begin praising Buddha. Too happy to even think about where Samoon found this book from. They begin thanking him for it and ask him how they could repay him. Since taking this opportunity, Samoon quickly twists the story and tells the monks that they don't need to do anything since he only found the book in a cave when he got lost whilst traveling with Thousand Mile Escort Agency. In the cave, he found a wooden box in which he found the book that said it belonged to the Shaolin Temple. Guess Samoon is as good of a liar as his grandfather. Hearing the name of the Thousand Mile Escort Agency, Yamno asks him what he's doing there. In response, Samoon tells him that he's working there as a handyman. Consequently, Yamgo tells him that the leader of that agency is also one of the Shaolin Temple, John One Sam. Bowing down, Somu tells the monks that he must take his leave now, since his work here is done. However, the monks start begging Somu to stay, so that they can repay their debt to him. But trying to leave there as soon as possible, Somu remains firm in his stance. Just then, the eldest monk of the temple joins the meeting. Standing up in honor and respect, all the monks bow down and inform him that the Tome of Heart Sutra has been retrieved. Taking a close look at Samoon, so that's it guys if you want more, then like and comment, and subscribe to our Manhua Ghost YouTube channel for more quality full content. We create every Manhua recap video after searching a good Manhua. Other side script writing is a headache. So guys, there is too much effort to create a Manhua video. So please guys support me. Thank you.